We're here at the IS meeting in Kuala Lumpur with Michelle Kazaskin, who is the special envoy to the UN uh, from on in the area of Eastern Europe and uh, and uh, Central Eastern, Asia. And Central Asia, and it's a, a huge task because those are some very very um, how can we say it? It's important areas to to be covering these these days with the. Uh, with the issues around uh, drug use and, and HIV and AIDS and so forth, I guess those are the main concerns. Is that issue? Yeah, huge concerns. I mean, this is the region of the world now where the epidemic is expanding mm -hmm. in contrast to the overall where others are flattening pattern out, or flattening out. or actually decreasing. decreasing yeah. You may remember that in the last UNAIDS WHO report, mm -hmm. um, it was shown that there is an overall 25% decrease in mortality mm -hmm. and in new HIV infections mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the region, it's just the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, and a year and a half ago, UNAIDS was saying that there are actually, as a mirror image, seven countries in the world where mortality and new infections have increased by 25%. Mm -hmm. And five of these seven countries are in this region. There was a meeting that you um, spoke first at yesterday. That was yesterday, wasn't it? Yes, was. it was. Gosh, it seems like a week ago. Uh, I'd like if you could give your summary uh, of that, a really brief summary of, of what you presented there, because that really, to me, your, your presentation was probably the most impactful for me. Well, thank you. Uh, the, um, that session was a, um, it was called a high-level panel, but it was a panel bringing together uh, Malaysian authorities, so the local authorities, and actually me as a representative of the Global Commission on Drug Policy um, to discuss drug policies, and, and this is a major um, a problem to be discussed, I believe, here at a scientific conference mm -hmm. because we, we will actually not tackle the HIV AIDS epidemic in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, or in Asia in general, where it's largely driven by people who use drugs, unless mm -hmm. we, we shift mm -hmm. uh, drug policies. Mm -hmm. That is, we create the policy environment that will allow for harm reduction mm -hmm. to be significantly scaled up. Um, I was speaking there uh, on behalf of, of the Global Commission. Another member of the Global Commission joined me for the session here today. Mm -hmm. She is Asma Yagan here, mm -hmm. um, the current UN Special Rapporteur on Religious Freedom and uh, previous UN Rapporteur on Summary Executions, an activist and a lawyer from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I mentioned a few words about this group, the Global Commission, and let me uh, just say this is a group of 20 plus sort of high profile people. There are about seven or eight former presidents or heads mm -hmm. of state. There's Kofi Annan, there's Ruiz Arbour, Richard Branson, Paul Volcker, mm -hmm. quite a, a group of people who've really decided to come together and advocate for drug policies to shift from aggressive prohibition law enforcement mm -hmm to more human rights and health-oriented approaches. And the points uh, I made yesterday are basically the following. One, it is that what's been called the war on drugs, this is a Richard Nixon vocabulary, mm -hmm. uh, but still true in many parts of Asia, mm -hmm. including in Thailand a few years ago, remember. We're still seeing the echo. Absolutely. <laughs> the war on drugs has failed. Mm -hmm. That is, those strategies uh, based on prohibition and aggressive law enforcement uh, have, have not led to any decrease in drug use. Actually, drug consumption has increased. Mm -hmm. uh, for opiates, it's like 30% in the last 20 years. Um, for cocaine, it's uh, about the same proportions. There are 200 new drugs coming on the market now with synthetic drugs every, mm. every year. So by any metric you could take, uh, it has failed. And that not only those policies have failed, but they've been harmful. Mm. 
-hmm. They've been harmful in actually generating social violence, as we've seen in in Mexico, 50,000 deaths Mm -hmm. from the war on drugs. They've been leading to human rights abuses, to corruption, and to a flourishing parallel economy, which is currently estimated to be about $350 billion per year. Mm -hmm. Huge business. And of course, for us in the AIDS community, these policies have actually been fueling the AIDS epidemic and also the hepatitis and the TB epidemics. One in five person who injects drugs is HIV positive. Mm -hmm. Two out of three persons who inject drugs worldwide are HCV positive. And the risk for acquiring TB is absolutely high. The figure I gave yesterday is that if you are an HIV positive person who uses drugs and you're incarcerated now in the Russian Federation or in Ukraine, in that region, your risk of contracting TB is like 25 times that in the general population. And when I say TB, it's very often now Mm MDR-TB. And there are many reasons why HIV is so linked to, uh, let me say, bad or inappropriate uh, policies. Mm -hmm. One is that because of police harassment, because of the fear of arrests, people will not seek services. uh, And people will actually be driven underground Mm -hmm. and they will be sharing equipment and injecting in unsafe environments. Mm -hmm. Second, these are countries, the countries that have the harshest drug policies are also the countries where there's no or very little access to opioid substitute therapy and to clean needles and to needle exchange programs. And any barrier to those programs, of course, drives people to risk behaviors and and to avoidable uh, risk factors. And third, there are the prisons. People who are arrested because of use or possession uh, go to prison and prison is by itself a risk factor for HIV and for HCV and for TB. So everything put together, uh, what comes out of this is that the world and particularly Asia, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where the epidemic is so largely driven by drug use, are spending huge amounts of money on ineffective repressive Mm -hmm. drug policies, whereas that money could be spent on productively on proven evidence-based health Mm -hmm. interventions. So you think it'll take the, um, the celebrity, so to speak, of these important folks and and to move this in the right direction and influence the governments and the Yes, I don't know whether we should call them celebrities. It is slightly different. I've seen the world of celebrities, you know, uh, in AIDS and uh, uh, when I was at Global Fund, of course. These are are really, um, these very interestingly are for many of them political people, but former presidents. Mm -hmm. So you could say this is former, former. Mm -hmm. It's easy to speak, you know, afterwards. Mm -hmm. But I found the message very strong. I was with former president of Poland, who is on the commission, Mm -hmm. a few days ago in Kiev, in, Mm -hmm. in, in Ukraine. And he said, in 2005, when I was president, I signed a bill criminalizing drug possession. And now I can tell you, I know I was wrong, Mm -hmm. and this is why I'm joining this Global Commission. This was Mm -hmm. on the front page of every newspaper. I was going to say, did he make that public? Absolutely. (laughs) And uh, he made it on TV, and uh, this is very strong. Um, and, And it's not only former people that are actually speaking out. The new president of Mexico, Mm the new president Santos of Colombia, the president of Guatemala, are now saying uh, we we can't continue this way. And as you know, in the last Mm -hmm. meeting uh, with President Obama in Harbor in the last summit of Mm -hmm. the uh, Organization of American States, uh, the Latin Americans said to President Obama, you're the number one market driving the production Mm -hmm. and export. We 
we have to change and revise the policies. Mm -hmm. um, so um, what I'm saying, sorry, I've shifted slightly. It's not that I don't see this group as a group of celebrities. I see this group as a group of people who for most of them have had or still have huge political impact. I mean, President Cardozo, former <coughs> president of Cardozo of Brazil, still has a huge, huge impact. Kofi Annan mm -hmm. still has a huge impact. Uh, Paul Volcker, when he came to the uh, British Parliament to speak on behalf of the Commission, you know, was mm -hmm. clearly listened to. So, um, yes, I think what that Commission has achieved, mm -hmm. it's at, at least opening the debate. And I'm seeing now the debate, I'm not saying it's the only the Commission, you know, the work of the civil society mm -hmm. is, is great, but at one point it's, it's, it's catalyzed uh, with a more political and global message, and that's what the Commission does. And they, they seem to be genuinely interested in this. They, they, I mean, to really come back and say, I made a mistake and I really, I'm trying to do my part now to rectify that. By yes, yes. Yeah. And um, Kofi Annan, for example, really engaged now himself in uh, creating an Af West African Commission on mm -hmm. Drug Policy, which is now working, chaired by former president of Nigeria, Obasanjo, mm -hmm. and uh, that is to give its report in next year, in the spring of 2014. And this is a really, I think, an anticipatory sort of uh, move, w whereas as at the time when we see what's happening in Mali, when we all realize terrorism mm -hmm. is largely financed mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. drug money, uh, this region which has basically no no policies yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it's it's the right time to reflect mm -hmm. and to find in the policy a right balance between repression, which we want, but we want to target, mm -hmm. you know, those who who traffic, those who, who 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 profit with with enormous amounts of money, and a um, an approach to the user. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that is an approach based on health, mm -hmm. because the purpose of a policy is to have a healthy and peaceful society. Mm -hmm. it, it's not to sort of have people kill themselves and people die from lack of access to mm -hmm. services. You've made a big impact over the years, and, and uh, I know you've been always in good positions where you could be effective. And it, it leads me to, to ask the question that you... Um, where do you, how do you, how did you evolve your sense of importance in this field, and wh what are your roots? Um, thank you for the question. Um, actually, it goes back to my earliest days in AIDS. Mm -hmm. I I really started, you know, with the very beginning of the epidemic, mm -hmm. eighty three, eighty two, eighty three. Mm -hmm. uh, but and but when I started the first my, my first clinic uh, in a Paris hospital, um, eighty four, eighty five, when we were beginning to have access to the first tests, mm -hmm. and I was actually seeing people who were detected as LAV mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, positive and then HIV uh, positive. Mm -hmm. um, very soon, the number of people. Exponential. Was, was increased, yeah. mm -hmm. increasing, and the proportion of people using drugs was pretty high. Mm -hmm. My hospital was in a part of Paris where there was a lot of trade, mm -hmm. um, and it's about 35% of the cohort in those days, in the, let's say, mid-late 80s, that, mm -hmm. that was drug users, and I saw so many of these people die you know, before uh, the advent of, of mm -hmm. therapy. In, uh, there was at that time also a growing interest for harm reduction. Needle exchange came in France in 87, 88. Methadone came a little later. Mm -hmm. But in 1992 or so, with a, a number of colleagues, we set up um, in the hospital where I was working the, that was the second needle exchange uh, program in, in France mm. and one of the first methadone 
programs and it was a, a low threshold uh, center where people could just walk in any time uh, and it was like one of those how do you call them prefabricated mm -hmm. blocks yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one door was on the street the other door was on the hospital so it was sort of linking yeah. the street and care mm -hmm. and I've worked a lot of that so I kept a lot of interest and now that I'm really and, and during my times at the Global Fund I was very keen on actually having the fund uh, uh, finance uh, harm reduction programs, be it in China, in mm -hmm. Eastern Europe, in, in Asia, throughout the world. And I'm quite proud that you know, the Global mm -hmm. Fund has mm -hmm. been and is at this time by far the main international funder for harm reduction programs. And now that I am in this position as envoy for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where the epidemic is primarily driven by drug use, um, yeah. sort of all of these interests converge. And you're a natural for this particular position. And, and so, well, at least all of the elements of the puzzle come together, so mm -hmm. whether I, I work as, um, let's say, a political activist on uh, harm reduction, uh, with the global all for drug policy reform, mm -hmm. or whether I actually uh, work with the Robert Carr Fund to mm -hmm. fund civil society networks that deal with underserved populations, or whether I'm in those envoy functions, there is a lot of overlap and convergence, and, and mm -hmm. this is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Well, as a member of the HIV community, I certainly thank you for your efforts, and certainly is appreciated. And uh, we thank you for your yeah, time here. Thank you. Thank you.